Is thinking just a pre-scientific word that refers to your brain working? Let's consider. Hello philosophers, I'm Chico. Welcome to The Philosopher Show, where we consider the greatest questions of human history. Now, in our first video of this playlist, we discussed the mind-body problem. If you don't remember, you can go back and check that out, but brief recap here. It seems like we have two different kinds of things, at least at first blush. First, we can have one category of thing, which we can call the mind slash psychological states. And in this category, we can talk about thoughts, such as nor in rad surfs, sensations such as a pain in the hand, or choices such as the choice to return a stolen candy bar to the store. So that's one category of things, but then we have another category of things that we can call the brain slash body category. And in this category, we can put stuff like neurons, neural networks, firings of synapses, etc. Now the brain is obviously made out of matter, but when we consider those things that we put under the mind category, it's kind of hard to see how those things could be made out of matter. It seems like they might be immaterial, not made out of matter, and therefore that the mind must be some non-material thing. And of course, if the brain is material and the mind is not material, it seems like they must be two different things. So the mind-body problem is this. What is really real here? Is there an immaterial mind that's separate from the brain? And if so, how do the two things relate to each other? Is there nothing but the brain? And if so, how does it go about doing all those jobs that we thought an immaterial mind would be doing? Is there nothing but the mind? And if so, is all the stuff that I'm looking at right now an illusion? Or do neither the brain nor the mind exist? And if so, how do we even make sense out of such a position? So those are four broad categories of responses to this mind-body problem. Both of them exist, that only the brain exists, that only the mind exists, and that neither exists. First, we'll look at brain-only views. So. Why think there is just a brain and no mind? Imagine you're going on a road trip with some friends. You know everybody in the car, but you don't know this one guy, Trey, that gets the back seat. And if you're like me, I always get shotgun because I'm always really good at calling it. And in shotgun, if you're like me, you know that you get to play DJ for the car. You get to pick the songs. Now, I take that DJing pretty seriously. You know, I do want to introduce you to some new music just to expand your palate. But of course, I want to make sure everybody likes the genres I'm playing. But Trey's kind of a wild card here, right? You, you don't really know what he likes. And let's say when you ask him what he listens to, he does that thing where he, I just, I listen to everything. Yeah, no, you don't listen to everything. But he says that and there's nothing you can say back to him. So you're going to kind of have to do a guessing game here. The first song you pick, let's just say is trap music. You play the song, you take a little quick peek back and you see that Trey gets a big smile on his face and he starts to, you know, get a little into it. You think to yourself, ah, Trey is really enjoying himself. I'll let this song keep playing. The next song you pick, let's say is a country song. You look back, take a peek at Trey and you notice a grimace and a, a dour look across his face. Trey is no longer dancing. He has a, a look of disgust and you think to yourself, Trey must not be enjoying himself right now. He must have an awful feeling going on uh, and that's causing this frowny face coming out. I think I'm gonna go ahead and skip this song. Third song you pick is a trap song again. You take a peek back and there Trey is getting back into it again. You think to yourself, success. He's enjoying himself again. Trey must really like trap music. So to summarize, you noticed a correlation. Trap music equals smiles, country music equals grimaces. Next, you posited an entity. You theorized that there were internal experiences going on inside of Trey. Things like pleasure and disgust. You theorized about a causal relationship. Trap music causes pleasure within Trey. Pleasure within Trey causes smiles. Country music causes disgust within Trey. Disgust causes causes grimaces. From that theory, you made a plan to achieve a desired result. You decided, I'm gonna play more trap music to have Trey smile, and your plan was successful. Trey was smiling. Now, this method achieves the desired result, but does it get to the truth about Trey? Let me change the story up a little bit. Let's say that you're a Neanderthal caveman named Java. You and your people are primitive, you know nothing about fire, but you live in freezing conditions and fire sure would be instrumental to your survival. Suddenly, a lightning strike catches wood on fire. You notice how warm it is and how everybody's enjoying it, but you also notice that the wood starts to disappear and once the wood is totally gone, the fire leaves too. What's happened? Well, you theorize there must be fire demons and they love to eat wood. Whenever one of them lands, I can keep giving it wood and it'll stay alive or stay around or something like that. But whenever the wood runs out, they either die or they run away or something. Next time you have a fire, you keep feeding it wood. Everybody stays warm, everybody stays happy. And notice we could summarize this in the same way we summarized the car trip. You noticed a correlation, wood equals fire, no wood equals no fire. You 
you posited an entity, you said that there must be fire demons that exist inside of this fire. You theorized about a causal relationship. Wood causes the fire demons to stay. Fire demon causes fire to burn. Absence of wood causes fire demons to leave or to die. And that causes the fire to go out. You made a plan to achieve a desired result. Feed wood to the fire. Your plan was successful. Everybody was warm. So notice in both cases, you posit an entity. In both cases, doing so leads to a successful result. But in the second case, it's clear that the entity we posited wasn't real. And in fact, you can consider an addition to this story. One day while defending your people from wolves, you fall into a river and freeze. Your body is eventually discovered by modern explorers and ultimately evil scientist Simon Stagg resuscitates you and makes you his servant. One day you see a fire burning and you mention, ah, I see fire demons are still around. Pretty cool. But Stag stops you right there and he explains that fire is a result of combustion. A high temperature breaks down the compound molecules that recombine with oxygen and ultimately result in fire. So now notice we have the same correlation as before. Fire correlated with wood. We have the same plan for the desired result, feeding wood to the fire. We have the same success. The fire stays where it's at. But now we have a new scientifically informed theory, combustion. Now the fire demon theory was just a story that Java told himself to help sort of explain what was happening. And it was made without a proper science scientific investigation. It was something kind of like folklore, and for that reason, we'll call it a folk theory. The scientific theory of combustion was based on later and more sophisticated scientific evidence. So what should Java do in the face of this new scientifically enlightened theory? He should dump the folk theory in favor of the scientific theory, right? He should deny that the posited entity exists. He should say, no, I do not believe that fire demons exist. So let's go back to that road trip story. Let's say you decide to comment on this. You say, wow, Wow, Trap Music Trey, you really love this music, huh? You must be having a pleasurable feeling, a pleasurable experience going through you to cause this smile. And a different friend that's also riding with you guys will say, Nalida, the neuroscientist, says to you, false. Trap music causes a neural pathway to begin to fire, and that's what causes the smile on Trey's face. And you say, yeah, well, neural firing, sure. But it's also caused by an internal experience he's having, right? Pleasure. And Nelly says to you, only one thing causes another thing. Your theory is just a folk theory. My theory has scientific evidence. So notice, just like what happened with Java, we have same correlation, trap music correlated with smiles, same plan for the same desired result, play trap music, same success rate, produce smiles, but now we have a new scientifically informed theory, neural firings. Do you see how our situation is kind of like Java's? For this reason, some philosophers of mind have called the theory that the mind is the reason for behaviors, folk psychology. It's a theory that was produced before we had scientifically sophisticated evidence. And what should we do in the face of this new scientifically sophisticated theory? Well, eliminativists about the mind say that we should do the same thing that Java did. We should dump our folk psychology and deny that the posited entity exists. We should deny that inside a tray there's this internal experience of pleasure. Trey's not actually experiencing anything. There's no such thing as experience. All that there is is those neural firings. Now this is a pretty big stretch to say that the experiences in the mind just don't exist. So let's say you object to Nelly. You say, no way Nelly, I know what causes me to smile and trap music Trey is just like me. And then let's say the driver Rob, the robotics expert, starts to laugh and you look over at him like, what's so funny, man? And he says to you, <laughs> actually, Trey is just a super realistic robot. I just have him in the back there to see if I could fool you guys. I programmed him to react like that to trap music, but he's not actually experiencing anything inside of him. Nelly says to you, aha, see, your theory is wrong. And you say to her, well, your theory's wrong too. You said that he had a brain and he doesn't have a brain. He just has mechanical stuff. And Nelly says to you, yes, but at least I have the same kind of explanation. Trap music tray might have nothing but pulleys and levers inside of there, but at least it's a physical mechanism, much like that big wet machine inside of your head is. You, on the other hand, were positing some kind of ghostly internal experiences that we can't point to inside of Trey. That's clearly wrong. So. Here, in general, is the eliminativist argument. Number one, when a belief in an entity is solely the result of a folk theory that has been superseded by a valid scientific theory, you should stop believing in that entity. And remember, this was just like Java not believing in fire demons anymore because his theory was replaced by that more scientifically enlightened theory of combustion. But number two, the mind is the result of a folk theory, folk psychology, that has been superseded by a valid scientific theory, neuroscience. So three, the conclusion, we should stop believing that the mind exists.
Now, premise two may seem suspect to you. You might think, don't I know of at least one mine, my own? And the eliminativist story would be this. No, you don't. Here's what happens. You see trap music tray, you see that look on his face, you posit this internal experience in him. Then later on, you get a smile and you think, oh look, we both have that same kind of external result. I am going to posit an internal experience in myself, just like I did for Trey. And that's the only reason that you think that you have a mind when really you're nothing but a brain. Unfortunately, I think here is exactly where eliminativists just become totally implausible. I mean, is that really what happens? Imagine you being a baby and seeing a smile on your mom's face and saying, I'm gonna posit a theory that she's having an internal experience. Later on, a smile is observed on your own face. I'm going to take that theory, the uh, an internal entity, and I'm gonna apply that to myself and say that I have an internal entity of mind. Now, it seems like that gets things the wrong way around, right? And in fact, the only reason why we would think that Trey had a mind in the first place is because first, we observed our own minds. So we have an experience like a sense of pleasure when we hear music, then a second experience, we perceive a smile on our own face, we have a third experience, which is perceiving the smile on Trey's face. And then we undergo a mental process called reasoning. We think to ourselves, ah, two smiles. I have an internal experience that I've observed. I'm gonna posit that into Trey. And it's only at this last step where we can actually make a mistake here and, and think that the robot is having some kind of internal experience. But again, notice we started off with our own experience with a direct observation of our perceptions. So this story really seems to be this. Number one, the existence of my mind is a datum of observation. Number two, the existence of a mind, you know, some mind in general, is a logical consequence of number one. And number three, the existence of other minds is posited to explain other observations like smiles, grimaces, etc. So premise two in the eliminativist argument only applies to other minds, not to minds in general, and definitely not specifically to my mind. A second objection we can have to this view is this. In that first objection, we pointed out the observation of our own mind, but only to show that the theory that this eliminativist would come up with is a bogus story. This second objection is also going to point to the observation of our own minds, but not to reject the eliminativist story about how we posit minds in general. Rather, whether or not this is how we come to believe in a mind, it's still the case that I directly observe my own experiences. So maybe it is the case that I posited a mind that I have in order to explain my smile and my frowns and all those kinds of things. But right now, I can directly perceive that I'm perceiving. And so that's not a result of a theory. That's a datum of observation. Now, the typical response here by eliminativists will be, that these experiences that we're talking about here, yeah, those are just illusions. They're not real. And this is going to be a continued problem for all brain-only theories. So I'm gonna make a separate video for this as well, but it's worth talking about here too. Whether or not anybody else has their own separate experiences or anything like that, it's impossible for a person to doubt that they themselves are having an experience. Or at least if, if you doubt the existence of the self, that experiences exist. But if you don't know what I'm talking about, don't worry about that. The only possible response to this is that your experiences are an illusion. But think about it, an illusion just is an experience. It's like saying, no, you're not really having an experience, you're just having an experience. Worse, an illusion is an experience with no external reality associated with it. So if I'm having an illusion right now, if this whole experience thing is just an illusion, well, how did I come to discover the brain in the first place? Wasn't it through direct observation? And if my observation is just an illusion, then I have no reason to believe that the brain exists in, in the first place. In other words, the illusion response actually proves the exact opposite. It proves that the mind exists and it damages our belief that the brain exists. Now, to be clear, the illusion response here doesn't disprove the existence of the brain. But if our perception of the brain is just an illusion, then we have no reason to believe that a brain exists. But again, that's only on this assumption that all these perceptions that I'm having are just an illusion. In other words, it's just a problem if the eliminativist says that these perceptions are an illusion. It's not that these perceptions are actually illusions. This is kind of heady stuff. But again, I'll make a whole separate video on just the illusion response here. So if you're kind of still confused, don't worry about it. Maybe ask me some questions in the comment. I'll try to get you to understand it a little bit, but if not, then I'll make another video later. Anyway, that's all I've got for the eliminativist theory. Please don't forget to like, subscribe, and comment, and I'll see you next time. Adios.